Welcome to another edition of the Veterans Business Podcast. I'm Aaron Spatz. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. If there is an episode that you specifically enjoy, I'd love for you to let me know that. Uh, I love your feedback. So tell me what you're enjoying and also tell me what you'd like to see more of. Um, I'm always curious kind of what what you are thinking of or what what you're wanting to see uh, through the show. Uh, as you know, I mean, we've had a tremendous just run of just amazing interviews with some really cool people of all sorts of different backgrounds. And so today is no different. Uh, today, this week, we offer and we welcome uh, Stephen Walsh to the podcast. Steve uh, is a 20-year veteran of the Marine Corps. He's had a very interesting career path uh, since getting out back in 1999. He's served in various organizations, and he's worked in a variety of overseas roles, uh, which we will, we will unpack much of that, I'm sure. So he is currently the Managing Director of Global Operations for Traxxas. Steve, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. Aaron, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, why don't we just kick it off by, you know, let's take a quick, quick tour of your upbringing. Uh, you know, what was what was the young version of Steve like or the youngest version of Steve like uh, and what what compelled you to join the military? Yeah, my my father and grandfather uh, were both military veterans, although not career um, individuals. They both served my grandfather during the First World War uh, in France and my father during the Second World War in Korea. So I think I always had a military uh, understanding or obligation. Uh, I grew up mostly uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And uh, on, when I was 17, I joined the U.S. Navy. Uh, within about six months, I got sent to the Naval Academy. And at the Naval Academy, I uh, played uh, football. I was also on the parachute team my last two years. Um, which was a, a great benefit, actual to, to my uh, later service as a Marine. Commissioned in 79 and spent uh, 20 years in the Marine Corps, primarily in infantry special operations roles. Uh, did a very uh, interesting tour uh, at Fort Bragg, did interesting tours in the greater DC area, you know, was a military advisor in El Salvador during the Civil War counter-narcotics strike team leader in Colombia, helped the Colombian military, uh, and then uh, did a tour in, in Beirut, uh, pre-bombing, post-bombing, and then um, finished up my uh, active duty uh, in 2004-2005, uh, getting recalled, uh, and did a year, 18 months in Iraq. So I had a very interesting career. Yeah, I would say that that falls a pretty pretty much more in line with like a very non-traditional career path is what it sounds like to me. It's like, and, and I, I've noticed that there, you'll, you'll, every once in a while, you'll run into some folks that just have very unique pathways uh, through their career. And so, I mean, one, I mean, like, how does that even happen? And then two, I mean, like, what was, what, like, what was one of the most memorable moments? Well, uh, certainly being able to lead um, Marines or lead allied forces in combat was um, by far, you know, the most significant uh, accomplishment and honor that I think I've ever had during my time in, on active service. I had a lot of in, very interesting staff jobs as well. I ran the sniper instructor school for the Marine Corps for three years. I served on the joint staff as a strategic planner. But I have to honestly say, you know, taking Marines forward, you know, in combat and uh, and and being successful in your endeavors is the ultimate achievement and should be the ultimate goal. I think of any Marine. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And, uh, and, and I just want to thank you for your, for your many years of service. I think it's uh, terrific. So share with us then, like, what was the, what was the journey like then when you got out of the military, but then you're talking about how you got recalled. So like walk us through some of that journey. I'd love to understand, you know, your first steps after you separated or I guess you actually re retired. Um, Correct. And so, and so, but so like, what was that like? Because you, you have a very interesting background, very interesting career. So you were immediately doing like um, foreign business. So like, how did that Correct. work? Correct. Yeah. Uh, about a year before I was eligible for retirement. So 98, I was working in uh, J5 strategic plans and policy on the joint staff and was focused on Latin America. I had a language capability at a foreign area officer designation. So 
I was working things in Colombia where I had worked before, uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, good stuff, you know, doing military to military engagements. I was talking to a lot of my friends and uh, they were um, all telling me that, you know, as you advance in rank, I was a lieutenant colonel at the time, you, you get farther and farther away from the action, you get farther and farther away from, you know, necessarily being an active participant in the solution. And so I, I started doing informational interviews and made a decision to retire. And I was very curious, you know, on various possible civilian careers and everyone eventually becomes a civilian, but I wanted to do it on my own terms. I didn't want to, you know, be the disgruntled passed over guy that, you know, um, gets, gets angry at the service and leaves and takes the first job he comes to. I wanted to be very planned and deliberate as, as, as I would encourage anyone to do. So I did a lot of our informational interviews and fortunately about six months before I eventually retired, I did an informational interview with a, a global power company, AES, and just to kind of see what executives in the power industry did. I had an engineering degree you know, from the Naval Academy, and, uh, had picked up an MBA in finance along the way, and I felt that I wanted to serve in a recession-proof industry, and I thought power was one of them, energy was one of them, um, and perhaps even uh, telecommunications. So I, I um, still hadn't declared, if you wish, my intention to retire. I was coming up on the end of my three years, so I knew I was going to either take a set of orders or put in retirement papers. And I and I had both options available to me, which was good. Um, so I um, finally, you know, did a uh, a series of interviews with AES, a global power company, and they needed someone to help run a piece of a distribution company uh, that's energy distribution. So basically, the people that that maintain the the transformers from you know you know twelve thousand kilovolts and below and, and bring the power to your house, the, basically the electric company. And uh, they had won the concession in the Dominican Republic. They were looking for someone that was one willing to move to the Dominican Republic that spoke Spanish and had an engineering background. Well, I had my only hands-on electricity experience uh, was in El Salvador when I helped uh, rebuild a geothermal power plant that had been damaged by the gorillas in a rocket attack. It, it wasn't distribution, it was on the generation side. And, uh, but I, I didn't know anything about energy distribution, but I figured I could learn. And I went through a series of interviews and they pitched me and said, you know, you've got the leadership capability, you've got the desire to learn a new skill set. Um, do you want the job? And um, I signed up. I said, uh, let me think about it. I talked to a couple of my friends and then um, I went back to them and, and uh, on a handshake, no formal offer letter. It was a handshake, you know, with my then later became my boss, a guy named Carl Huber, a former captain in the army uh, who was a spent his, he was a lawyer and he spent his whole time in the um, Army Corps of Engineers, never wore a uniform and never left the United States, but a wonderful man. And um, so I went back to uh, headquarters Marine Corps, gave my uh, letter uh, into the uh, uh, little old lady in tennis shoes who processes your retirement, told the monitor he was a little upset, but we got over it. And um, 29 days later, I left the Marine Corps, uh, had my retirement ceremony on a Thursday, took Friday off and started work the following Monday in uh, Santo Domingo, uh, the Dominican Republic. It did it a uh, brief uh, course of instruction on, on energy distribution with a, a friend of mine uh, from Dominion Power, who uh, I had met a couple of years earlier. And so I knew all the terms and terminology, then did a, a few online courses. So when I showed up, I at least had enough knowledge to be dangerous. Um, after about three months, we took over the concession and my boss gave me one third of the existing you know, concession of the footprint. So I had about 150,000 meters to service 
on the eastern half of the island. So I had seven commercial offices, about 250 people working for me, office personnel, line crews, stuff like that. And my job was to collect the money and to keep the power on uh, to people. Man, that's an incredible, I mean, there's just, there's so much that you just shared. And I think it's important. One, like, I, I want to go back to something that you'd said. And um, you, you spent a lot of time doing informational interviews. And I think that is such a secret weapon for folks when they're looking to get out, looking to transition. It's, it's a, it's a different flavor. I get, I think of, of networking because now you're, you're, you're not, you're not necessarily interviewing for the purposes of, of securing the job. You're really just trying to learn more about the opportunity or the company or the culture or whatever. Right. And so, but what happens through that though, is you start developing these really cool relationships with people. And the next thing you know, they're like, you know what, like we've got an opening, you've got the skill set, you know, because they've asked about you, you've shared with them a little bit about your background. And that, now all of a sudden, they're like, why don't we just do this? Right? Correct. And, and the, the unique thing about informational interviews are I started 18 months out, a year out before I was going to leave. Yeah, so true. there's no a couple of things in your favor. If you're on active duty in the military, Remember, 99% of Americans have never served in the military, so they want to talk to you. A lot of them feel guilty that they never served, but they, they're they willing to talk to you. If you show up and you're on active duty and you want to learn about their business, they'll give you an interview. The other thing is, even if they wanted to hire you on the spot, you tell them right up front, I'm not available yet. I will be in a year, but right now or six months or right now. So it takes away the pressure of you pitching them and asking them for a job because so you tell them right up front, this is not about me asking for a job from you. That may happen a year from now, but everything could change. Yeah. So it puts people at ease. They want to be friendly. They want to be helpful to you. They really, in, in many terms, open the kimono up and show you the good and the bad side of their profession. Yeah. And it allows you to, again, you know, put that into your thought process as to, do I really want to be, you know, for example, I spent three days with a friend of mine who was an investment banker working at Goldman. And I shadowed him for three days. It was amazing, you know, and he, he did mostly trading, but, you know, ha had a very fast paced, hectic lifestyle. I realized after three days, I didn't want to be an investment banker in trading, you know, with Goldman Sachs. Sure. Great company, but not, not what I want to do. So I checked that off my list. I like the finance part, but not living in New York and not being a trader and working a trading desk. Yeah. Happy work for him, but you know, wasn't going to work for me. So that's what informational interviews give you. It helps you focus your search on what you want to do. Yeah. No, it, it it's amazing. And I and I think you, I mean, you hit it on the head. And I think so this is the this is the classic issue that that we run into here. So the audience, the people that are listening and watching this are probably 99% made up of veterans, like those that have already done the transition. And so one of the things that like, I've, I've had this conversation multiple times with people is you get so focused on the mission, the Marines, or, you know, whatever your branch of service happen to be, you get so focused in on what you're doing. It's easy to like, all of a sudden look up and realize like, holy crap, I'm six months away from punching out. I probably should start looking for a job. And then there's that guilt element that some people feel because they feel like they're not giving it all or giving it their all. And one thing I like, I think it's worth mentioning because I, again, you made the point really, really well. And my take on that is the, the informational interview is, is useful pre-transition, but I also think it is just as useful for any stage of your career. So if you're working in investment banking in New York or, you know, whatever your role is, and you're genuinely interested in, say, being a software developer, set up a bunch of informational interviews with software developers or software development managers or, or whatever. And so it, it's a great way to network without putting that, that pressure on that other person. I mean, I, I, like, I really loved how you said that because when you're interviewing a year out, there's no way they're going to hire you and there's no way you're actually looking for a job. So it's like, I, right. I think it's a really, really great and very underutilized tool. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about the international side of the business. So 
describe a scenario or describe a common misconception about international business? Okay, um, you know my my twenty years in, in corporate America, the vast majority of that has been working overseas uh, in um, in the Marine Corps. We used to refer to a lot of the places as, um, shall we say, uh, third world um, um, dung heaps, for example, yep. <laughs> uh, that, that oftentimes Marines and other uh, and military special operations folks wind up going into. In, uh, in corporate America, those are referred to as frontier markets. <laughs> and uh, so just a different, different terminology, but the challenges remain the same. I think that the the folks that are willing to go and and take over business leadership roles overseas in a foreign country will be pleasantly surprised when they come back to the United States and then take over a leadership role in a U.S. business. Far easier to run a business in the United States than it is to run a business overseas, and I think that's first and foremost. I think. The, the opportunities to hit it out of the park are certainly there overseas in, in any p l role you have, but also the downside is, you know, there are, there are opportunities or there are pitfalls that if you uh, make a mistake, sometimes those mistakes can literally wind you, you know, in jail and that you wouldn't be put in jail for, say, in the United States, uh, you know, for a, a business decision, to, you know, to do go left instead of right, but certainly it, in potentially it could land you in jail. And I can give you an example of that. When I worked in um, Kiev, Ukraine, I ran uh, two big distribution companies for AES. We serviced about 1.6 million meters uh, in the greater Kiev area, and then out in in, in the western part of uh, of Ukraine as well, near the city of Rovna, and. Um, so the tax authorities would come by every you know, month and ask for their tax payment, all legit, and we would wire money to them, fine. You know, we, we collected a lot of money, we paid a lot of taxes. Well, one, um, one day they showed up a week early and my CFO called me down to his office and uh, he says, uh, Steve, the, the tax authorities are here and they're pressuring us to pay our taxes early, a week early. And uh, I said, uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think we need to do that. And uh, I explained to them, you know, both in in Russian and in English, you know, we've always paid our taxes. It's not a question of not having the money, but we're going to pay them on time, but we're not going to pay early. And because um, it would have required us to, to to work some magic in the treasury and come up with some some cash that we would have take a line of credit on or something like that. But we could certainly have done it. But I said, no, no on principle. I'm not going to do that. Well, the next day, you know, I have, you know, two policemen pull me over as I'm driving home and you know, they give me the fifth degree. And the entire weekend, I basically have, you know, they're basically um, their SWAT team police following me around, stopping me constantly, harassing me. Now, it was kind of silly, but it was done purely because, you know, they were upset that I wouldn't direct my CFO to, to pay the taxes early. That would never happen in the United States. And, and finally, I got so, you know, kind of fed up with them. You know, I, I, I just said, okay, why don't you just go ahead and arrest me now? You know, put the cuffs on me and, you know, and throw me in jail. And then, um, you know, I need to catch up on my reading. And uh, then we'll sort this out, you know, over the weekend. Of course, they, you know, they refused to arrest me. And, uh, you know, the following week, I went to talk to their boss. We got it resolved. He apologized. But those types of things happen. They never happen in the United States, um, but they certainly could happen overseas. You're often faced with significant ethical challenges overseas that you may never encounter in the United States. And inevitably, you know, people look towards, you know, you know, the, the foreigner who's in charge, and certainly if he's an American, because they want to see, you know, if you're going to be able to make the hard call and you're going to do the right thing. Um, so that's a that's a big challenge from serving overseas, amongst others. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's a, uh, 
that I think right there just kind of pulls the curtain back on on, on some of the aspects of of uh, international business because the the U.S. Constitution does not apply to uh, to where whatever country you're working in, and so like U.S. tax code and all these other things, and so I mean. While the U.S. Constitution does not apply, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act does. Interesting. And a lot of people, you know, fail to understand that. So, you know, it, it can be applied, you know, to, to any time to an American company, American citizen, or others that are interacting. So that's always a, a challenge as well. And there were numerous times where, you know, people would want to, you know, in the normal course of business, you know, expect that you were going to reward them personally i.e. pay a bribe. And I would explain that, you know, that's a violation, even though if you did it, no one would find out about it in theory, uh, in, and the host country wouldn't care. You explain to them that's a that's a, a violation of US law and that I would be, you know, um, at fault and in violation. And so you, you just say, can't do that. Yep. And sometimes they understand that, sometimes they don't. Yep. Do you lose business because of it? Sure. But that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, I, I've I've experienced that personally. Probably nowhere near to the scale uh, and size that that you have. But I mean, without without going into too much detail, I've I've seen that. I've seen it in in some Asian countries that I've done business with, where it was expected that you are going to reward uh, certain people. And um and it, I mean, to to your point, I mean, it it could cost you business, and that's just ha- you just have to kind of come to terms with that. That Okay, you know, if that I mean it is what it is, you know. So right. um r- real quick, just because I mean I'm genuinely curious. I, I imagine others that are watching and listening to this may be gen- genuinely curious um as well. So the company that you were working for when you were overseas, was that a US entity? Was it a foreign entity? And so like how does all that work? Uh, it was a US entity, uh yeah. AES. They're you know, at that time they were a Fortune two hundred company, global power company. They had yeah. Operations in about 26 countries and uh, had about 40,000 people, you know, company wide. So okay. I, I I worked for them again primarily overseas. And um, it, in this that one particular time, I ran all the operations in both uh, Ukraine and in Kazakhstan. Wow. Did business development for them uh, in the Balkans and you know in the Eastern Europe region. So. It- kind of sounds like once you got that taste or once you got that mark on you as being like the international guy, then it was, you know, they were kind of queuing you up for you know, other potential possibilities. I mean, and then realizing too, I mean, we're not, we're not, you're not in Spanish speaking countries anymore. So you'd spend a lot of time in South right. America. So like, what was that transition like for you working in, in, in other foreign countries? Were you taking time? Like, did you have to learn the language? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I I spoke a little Russian before, and I did a a, a deep immersion into the Russian language, a uh, little Ukrainian, but primarily Russian, and that was the the the, the daily uh, conversation. And if it got super difficult, I'd bring a, an interpreter or translator in, but and 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 sometimes wound up doing that. But that's the nature of the beast. I think if you're willing to take an overseas assignment, you have to kind of go. Uh, all in. And, and I'll use the a military analogy of advisor. And I was an advisor um, uh, in Latin America several times in, in different countries. Uh, and I, y- you have to totally immerse yourself in the culture, the language, the whole experience. I use the same uh, path. If you're going to be a corporate executive overseas, you need to get into the language to the best of your ability, realizing the international language of business is English, so that helps a lot. But still, if you can't, you know, go to a restaurant, order off the menu in the host language, you know, that sends a message to people. They're like, you're not really vested in in this country here. You're just, you know, kind of a, a someone that's, you know, here temporarily, which you may be, but you're not interested in what in our culture and, and and how we do things. So that's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, taking taking that and and though it may not be perfect and maybe a little ugly, but just showing that you're taking effort and making strides to really become a you know a part of that community, um, yeah, I think it. I mean, definitely goes a long way. And people, I think, are more willing to work with you, or more willing to forgive any weird mistakes or any you know any funny things that you find yourself you know, running into. Correct. I I, I ran the 
AES operations in the Middle East, living in Dubai uh, after I left uh, Kiev, Ukraine. Did that for a couple of years and did the same thing. Learned a, a pretty good slug of Arabic. Went out of my way to, to speak Arabic when I could. Almost everyone I interacted with were absolutely perfect English speakers, but they appreciated the fact that I would try to stumble through Arabic with them understanding their host customs, you know, didn't, you know, went out of my way to make sure I didn't offend anyone, learn the culture. And I think that really helps. It certainly helps when you're going to a power plant uh, and 99% of the workforce are local inhabitants. If you can say hi to them, shake hands with them, speak a little bit of their local language, that's huge. But, you know, that's, that's leadership 101 that both of us learned in the Marine Corps or the Navy. And I think, uh, those uh, lessons really come to pay home in, in corporate America as they did on active duty. Yeah, for sure. No, it, uh, it, it, it makes a world of difference. And, uh, and, and right. I mean, we're always, I mean, even in the current threat environment, you know, working, you know, working with our, with our young Marines and helping you know, get them trained or, or understanding you know, language and cultural concerns. I mean, that, when I was in, that was a, that was a large, that was a huge concern is, you know, how do we interact with, with locals? I mean, what does that whole, I mean, what does that, what does that whole thing look like? And so putting, you know, making those decisions available to be made at the lowest level. So you've got a corporal on the ground making, you know, making some maybe bigger decision, but he's been trained and he's been empowered. And part of that comes with the you know, local language or, or, you know, cultural awareness, uh, maybe not a mastery of the language, but at least a, a better cultural, um, understanding. So um, we covered it already, but I was just curious. I mean, it, what what other aspects of international business do, do you think it's important that people understand? So if they are, A, maybe thinking about growing their business beyond the borders of, of, of the United States, what, what have you seen work and what have you seen not work when it comes to people trying to expand operations beyond uh, North America or at least uh, you know, beyond the U.S.? Well, again, if you have an existing business and you're you're wanting to perhaps go overseas, you know, one of the fundamental things that you need to understand is understand the environment. You know, in the in a military terminology, you would you know they call it MET mission, enemy terrain, you know, time, what what have you. Uh, in a business environment, you would really need to understand you know the local labor laws, the local laws as they relate to foreign investment? Is it better to do assembly, set up, or do you just want to drop widgets off on the shore? I advise several companies now uh, on the side that are doing business overseas. And for the most part, I really encourage them to do a deep dive you know, on their target audience or the target area before they're going to put you know, you know, people, time, and money you know, on the table or at risk, you know, to uh, to go forward. Surprisingly, a lot of people just think that you know, well, show up and, and I'll set up my my stand and everybody will flock and they'll buy it. You know, build it and they will come. That's not always the case. So I encourage people that the overseas market, you know, truly is you know ten thousand times bigger than what the say the U.S. domestic market is. But you want to be able to to do a very detailed and focused search on whether you have goods or services. And then, you know, ultimately, what is your competitive advantage? Why are they going to hire or buy from you versus hire or buy from somebody else? A lot of people fail to do that. They don't do their homework. Yeah. Um, no, I, and I, for some reason, and I don't know where that perception comes from, because I, I, I agree with you there's this there's this mindset that you know, build it and it will come i mean it's 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 gonna work it's like almost like a foregone conclusion and uh and, and no i think that's and and you've got a very i mean very well seasoned perspective on that not just not even just in one continent you've been all over the freaking place and so it's right. uh i mean you have a very unique perspective on that yeah for, at, as we're talking that, you actually had me think about that there's one other question I had for you related to like the legalities of working overseas. And so you, you, you've set up an entity on foreign soil, but you're not. So, so as you pointed out earlier, you, you could be prosecuted under certain law uh, for 
for any type of corruption. But what about legal recourse for the entity itself as it relates to being like just getting paid? And so right. realizing that the laws are different. I mean, if someone stiffs you or screws you over in a in, in an overseas deal, how do you deal with that? Well, well, first of all, I think it's again, we talked about understanding the environment. For for those people that that don't have a, a tax or a department or a general counsel with 500 lawyers on retainer, oftentimes, you know, if you want to do operations overseas, you need to hire an expert. Yeah. And, you know, for example, my sister, uh, Dr. Janet Walsh, um, who's got a, a doctorate in business, she operates a company called Birch Tree Global, uh, based out of New York. And one of the things that they do is they go and help you set up businesses overseas, either through the World Trade Council or just independently. And they use HR professionals uh, because you've got to have a workforce. They use tax professionals because, again, it's not how much money you make, it's how much tax you pay. And they also have legal professionals, how to set up the corporate structure. So that's the service that she provides. Uh, some people do that in-house, but whatever service and or group of people you, you do, you need to get it, those things nailed down very tightly because you can go overseas, like I said, put out your wares or, your, or hang out your shingle and it can run off the rails real quick because you, you haven't done the upfront analysis and or the foundation, if you wish, you know, to set up, you know, business operations. You know, certainly most countries there are, you know, if if you have a disagreement of someone say, you know, fails to honor a contract, you can take them to court. In some places, you'll be in court for years and there'll be no resolution. Other places are are pretty pretty quick. Many times companies will have a, a dispute clause in a contract where they will take the dispute, you know, to a you know, basically another country. It could be under New York law, for example, the United States, or under British law. So uh, they'll have a governing law that would, would um, or an authority that would make the final decision on a dispute. That's all well and good. So you have a dispute and you go before a judge in New York because that's what the contract says and the judge rules in your favor. That's that's 50% of the battle. The other 50% of the battle is recovering from the other side, the other party. And many times you can get a judgment against someone, but you never get any money back that they owe you because you can't find it or you, you can't get an enforceable um, decree to go after their, their assets. So it, it can often be complicated. Big thing is know who you're doing business with. Yeah. Know, you know, know your customer. Yeah. No, that's good. That's that's really good insight. Um, I'd like to share something else with you because I've I've done I've done a, a a fraction of international business previously, and I'd love to understand your perspective and your opinion or position or experience dealing with uh, foreign agents. And so, you know, companies for you know for those that aren't as familiar, and you you'll probably explain this way better than I can. Uh, but for for companies that don't actually have an, a foreign entity set up. In the whole taxable structure and you know, sure. legal legal formation, they'll partner with with a with an overseas agent that helps do a lot of the functions you're talking about. So, you know, pay you know, payroll. They they take they take a cut. They take some type of slice off of an hourly or day rate or some contractual thing that you work out. But what's been your experience dealing dealing with dealing with that kind of of, of a setup? I think um, a foreign agent operation works well, you have to have the right foreign agent, someone that, you know, is trustworthy, reliable, that is, you know, not going to violate, again, we went back and talked about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, is not going to conduct business as usual in the country, you know, that that's the way everyone does it. Well, that could, that could certainly run a file and blow back on the individual itself. But, you know, having someone on a retainer that is, you know, in a contract that's legally binding that agrees to follow not only U.S. rules but your intentions and you know and directions to the letter is invaluable. Yeah. You know, and you can. There's lots of very good foreign agents out there that can really help you grow the business. 
There's also a lot of people that would just love to take your money and do nothing in return. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Well, I, I, I appreciate your, your perspective on that. I was, I, I was just gen- genuinely curious. Sure. Well, I, I know your list of problems that you've had to deal with is not short because that's part of the reason that you were the guy for the job. I mean, uh, the guy with a foreign, you know, a foreign background, U.S. military, had a very successful career, and then you jump into the civilian space, and you know, you're just knocking out all these different assignments and just doing doing a bang up job. I'm sure you've got a long list of 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 these examples, but yeah, I would love to understand like what like what what is one or or a few sizable problems uh, in the business that you've that you've had to overcome, and how did you get through it? You. Yep. Probably the biggest challenge in business I've found, whether it's running one in the United States or, or operating overseas, is getting the right people in the in the right seat on the bus. And you know, that's a that's a very you know popular business school phrase where people will talk about you know getting the right person in the right assignment, you know, and sometimes you have to make some tough calls to do that. You know, remember that when when people hire you. They're going to hire you for one of two reasons. Can you make the company money or can you help save the company money or a combination of the two? They're not going to, nor should they, hire you for any other reason but that. If you use a sports analogy, if you're the quarterback, as you know, the, the one with the PL responsibility, the leader of the business or the leader of the business unit, then it's up to you as the quarterback to put the people in the right positions on the field to score a touchdown. And oftentimes, you know, and I saw this time and time again, you had people, you know, in sales job, for example, and they were introverts. They were, they would never succeed because it just wasn't in their nature and their personality. Uh, So you move that person, say, to a back office job, you know, working in, you know, as a comptroller or, you know, in the treasury department where they don't have to go out and interact with strangers all the time, they hit it out of the park. Again, here's the perfect example of had a guy, both very capable individual, but he was in the wrong seat on the bus. So that's probably the, one of the biggest challenges, get the right people. The other thing is I firmly believe that most people want to show you initiative. They want to show you how smart they are. They want to show you that they can you know, take the ball and run with it. Again, a, a sports analogy. Oftentimes, people in control, they try to micromanage or they don't give people the authority and the responsibility to um, go out and do things on their own. And again, we both learned that you know, in the military. Uh, a lot of business leaders have never learned that, and they don't empower their people to get stuff done. And I see that also as a as a big obstacle to success. Wow. Yeah, I think uh, empowerment is huge. Um, it it has the potential to just breathe life into a team. It helps people discover what they're made of. It helps them perform. I think at their very best um, when it's when it's in the right in, in in the right situation. Which goes back to your first point, which is getting people on the right seat on you know in um, in the bus. And so are, are there any tools or any methodologies or any, anything that you use in, in helping assess that? So like, if you, let's say you're, you know, you, you just took over a role in an, in another, another branch of another country and you're walking in and you're like figuring out who's who in the zoo and what do we got to do? Is there, is there, I mean, and it may be a very informal thing that you do or maybe very formal, I have no idea, but is, is there anything that you kind of walk yourself through each time that you kind of inherit a new team or, or, or a new assignment? Yes, I always try to, to show up early, uh, early in the process, perhaps even before you've taken over a formal you know, turnover, you know, to get an idea of what the, what the immediate needs are, what the immediate crisis are, and hopefully identify two or three people that that at least after your initial impression and maybe catching a little bit of their background on paper, you can probably rely on to act as a fire brigade. I think that's important uh, because business is not going to stop just because the, the senior individual changes out. The business is going to continue on 
And if you have this lull while you quote learn the job or the people learn the people or stuff, you're probably going to the business is going to suffer. You're going to you're going to suffer as well. You're not going to be able to be as effective as you could be. That say as you get deeper into the job, you'll probably be more effective. You'll be able to to move people around. You'll be able to you know, give people certain extra responsibilities. Other people, you'll take away responsibilities and you may even have to fire some and that's okay. Uh, sadly, a lot of people have a hard time uh, terminating employees and which is, uh, I, I kind of find that unusual. Uh, as, a, as a former Marine like yourself, uh, Marine officer, you realize, you know, in the military, you gotta make some tough calls. Uh, oftentimes you make tough calls knowing that you can put people's lives at risk. Um, you don't have that in, in corporate America for the most part, but you do have tough calls from the standpoint you got to, you know, from, from time to time, terminate people or sell off a division, knowing full well that, you know, people are going to lose lose employment. And that's hard. And that shouldn't be done callously or it shouldn't be done, you know, without a lot of research and justification. But in the end, you got to be able to make tough calls. And I think that is one of the things that military veterans have over a lot of civilians is that we're used to making tough calls. And, you know, but when the tough call needs to be made, be decisive, don't waffle about it, make the call and move on. Make, make the call and move on. I like that. Um, don't, don't dwell and linger on it. I think that's good. Um, what, so what, what advice would you give to someone who's wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Well, again, I, you know, in, in a nutshell, I would say do your homework, do your informational interviews before you make the move, whether you're still on active duty or whether you've, you know, maybe, you know, left active service and now you're transitioning from one job to another. Uh, do your homework. A lot of people think, oh, I can do anything. Well, that's not necessarily true. Uh, you, you need to be well-schooled. You need to be constantly ready to learn some new skill sets. And sadly, a lot of military veterans aren't. So they get stuck into what is perceived as military veterans, you know, jobs, which oftentimes aren't the best fit for them. You know, well, I'll put him in charge of security because, you know, you know, he did a tour in the army and, and you know, he knows how to guard things. Well, come on, you know, most military veterans, yeah, they could all guard something, but woefully not the best use of their skill set. They can do all sorts of other things. They have the leadership ability to, to get people to get stuff done. So make a list of what things you might want to do, informational interviews, you know, and then if you have to reinvent yourself, learn a new skill set, get a new qualification, don't be afraid to do that. You know, um, some people are, oh, I'm tired or I don't want to, you know, move. Those are all understandable, but they also come as limitations. When people say, you know, gee, I'd like to go do that, or I'd like to be, you know, head of that business unit. Well, okay, are you willing to go anywhere and do anything to make that happen? Well, well, no. I, you know, I, I'm tired of moving, or I don't like to travel. Well, then, that may not be the job for you because that's the price you're going to have to pay to be successful. If you you know, say that what is successful. The skills you learn, you know, as a military veteran, you know, the hard skills, how to fly an airplane, drive a tank, you know, operate a nuclear reactor, what have you, they're all well and good. But in reality, the, the, the skills that are truly valuable as a veteran going forward in the business world are good old fashioned leadership getting a diverse group of people, some of which that you may not necessarily want to associate with, but you have to, like you did in the military, get them all together, you know, on the same bus, heading in the same direction, and get it across the finish line successfully without getting anybody killed or injured. You know, those skill sets, you know, the ability to understand various points of view, adapt to the culture, you know, push through adversity, show up, do whatever it takes to be successful. Those are the true, true skills that veterans have in the corporate workplace. And quite honestly, they're in desperate need of those skills. So I would encourage everyone that is you know, thinking about doing something different, 
do your homework, buck up, take the step, and you'll be successful. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm just, I'm just going to pull the string just, just because I can, but what, what makes you say that it's a, and, and like, I agree with you. I'm just curious. What, what makes you say that it's a, that it's in dire need that corporate America is in, is in dire need of that skill set? I, I, I've seen this time and time again, that oftentimes in corporate America, we have people that, um, you know, aren't willing to make difficult calls aren't willing to do whatever it takes to be successful. And I don't mean breaking the rules or violating some you know, ordinance or something, but I'm talking about, you know, what do we need to be successful? Does that mean the boss needs to show up at unexpected times and see unexpected things to correct deficiencies? Well, that would may what it take. Does that mean that you may have to forego that month long vacation you were planning because the business needs your personal attention? Or people in the business need to know that you're not doing this remotely, you're hands-on, you're backstopping them, you're taking care of them, you're giving them opportunity. Many people aren't willing to do that, yet they want the title and or they want the paycheck. To me, if you want the title and you want the paycheck, you know, that comes with a lot of responsibilities and you can't pawn those off on somebody else, you got to do them yourself. And people deserve to see the boss. They deserve to have a boss know that's going to back them up, hold them accountable, but at the same time, give them the opportunity to grow. And that's what military veterans bring to the table. Love that. I, I love how you said that. I think it was awesome. And I, and I hope for those that are watching and listening, you're, you're taking copious notes because there's just a lot. I'm telling you, Steve, there's just a lot of really, really awesome truths and lots of really good nuggets that you're throwing out here. And, uh, and I'm just I'm I'm grateful for you know, the experience that you've had and and being willing to share this uh, with me, but also with a wider audience. Uh, as as we wrap up, I, I I try to make it a habit or make it a point of handing over the last segment back over to the guest. If there's if there's anything that we had that we didn't get time to cover, I could talk I could talk to you for forever. Um, realizing time is short, but. If there's anything that uh, that you, we didn't get to that you'd love to share or any final parting shots, uh, would love to hand this back over to you. Sure. I think you should prepare any transition, whether it's your initial transition from the military to civilian life. And remember, everybody becomes a civilian sooner or later. Or if you've already left active service and maybe you're starting one career path and you decide this is not for me, I'm going to make a you know, 90 degree turn and go do something else, you really, really need to do your homework. You need to do the self-study. You need to speak to everyone and anyone that you can find to really make a determination of one, the landscape and the opportunities and the pitfalls that will be facing you. So many times people fail to plan. That said, the first plan doesn't survive contact, if it's a very popular phrase. And, and to some degree, that's true. But at the same time, you know, you want to be able to plan. You want to be able to understand the, the opportunities and the pitfalls ahead of you. You don't want to be going into something, you know, as a knee-jerk reaction. I saw too many people get upset, either in corporate America or the military, when they left, they didn't get promoted, they didn't get recognized. And they jumped and took, you know, went someplace else and took the first opportunity that was presented to them. Most often, they missed out on other better paying, more responsible opportunities because they were angry or they failed to plan. The analogy that you used about, hey, six months, I'm going to be out of the military. I have no idea what I want to do. Shame on those people. You know, you should have at least two or three things. I think I want to do that. And I'm going to try one for a year. And if that doesn't work out, I'm going to try something else. But to go out there, just kind of, you know, stumble around and hope someone else offers you a job or a career path that may sound interesting, that's a recipe for disaster. And it's never going to lead to success. Plan your transitions, whether they're from the military to civilian life or from one civilian job to the next. Plan those transitions as diligently as you would have planned 
any military operation that you ever participated in and you will be successful. Well, well, Steve, I, again, I just want to thank you. Thank you for taking uh, time to, to visit the show. Thanks for, uh, thanks for spending so much time with me. And thank you again for just sharing so much, uh, so many great words of wisdom. Really do appreciate it. Thank you, Aaron. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much to all your uh, stuff that you've done for both our veterans and our nation. Man, what a fun and exciting conversation. I just, I really enjoyed Steve's perspective. Um, I haven't had a lot of folks on the show that have international business experience. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. I thoroughly enjoy international business. It's been something that I've really enjoyed doing. Steve has made a career of it, doing it for now, probably over 20 years at this point now. And so it just, I really appreciated his insight and his perspective for those of you that work in international business. I'm curious what your feedback is to this. Uh, and those that are that are curious about international business, I think this kind of gives you a little bit of an inside peek at how some of that is done and some of the things to think about and look out for. Uh, one thing I really loved about the conversation was talking about the importance of in informational interviews. And I think it's something that we so easily gloss over. And I'm thinking about this selfishly, just even on the outside. So for me, I did not take as much time on my transition. I knew what I was going to do post transition, but I didn't take the time to do like, you know, 20 or 30 informational interviews. And I think if you've got the time to do that before you get out, it's great. But I think it's even more beneficial when you are out and maybe you're contemplating a career change. Maybe you're thinking about moving to a different city. Maybe it's a company within the same industry, or maybe it's a complete change of direction. It goes, it's basically networking if you really think about it, but reaching out to someone and saying, Hey, look, I'm not applying to a position. I just am genuinely curious about what you do, what this industry is all about. I'm just trying to learn more about it to gauge whether or not this is a move that I would consider doing for myself. And so again, it, it de-escalates, takes away a lot of the tension that people may feel uh, and some of that apprehension in speaking with you. But then at the same time, you're gonna start to forge a relationship. And if if something really speaks to you and really jumps out and you're like, man, that, that's the, this sounds exactly what I would love to do, and maybe you develop a great relationship with that person. Maybe it's then, maybe it's three, six months from now, a year from now, those opportunities may present themselves. So anyway, hope you enjoyed uh, the interview, the show. Again, would love your feedback. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And also I, I would encourage you, if, if there's elements of the show or, or if there's certain interviews that you really like, share them out. And I, I, I think it could really help a lot, of, a lot of different people. So anyway, again, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon.